Well, we are very fortunate to have Senator Harkin uh, with us, um, who was the floor manager of the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act and the uh, key sponsor of that uh, legislation. As you heard him discuss things last week, uh, the role that he takes with this, um, he has some uh, very definite words about this. But here's what we will do today. Um, first of all, we're going to give Senator Harkin about 15 minutes to talk about uh, the legislation, what this process was like for him. Uh, Senator, I don't know if Ruth is able to join us or not. Um, it didn't look like Ruth was going to be able to join us. Um, I thought it might be interesting to hear what it was like to be the spouse of someone who was uh, <laughs> champion, championing legislation like this. But with that, uh, let me turn this over to Senator Harkin. Well, thank you very much, Mark. And it's a delight to see you again, even though I, you're, you're all masked up. Of course, I'm sitting at home, so I don't have to put on a mask. And uh, again, uh, thank you for all of your leadership through all these years uh, in the Iowa legislature. I'm just sorry you're not still there, but you probably feel like I do when people tell me that they would like to have me back in the Senate. Been there, done that, and I put in my time. It's time for somebody else, right? <laughs> but. But Mark, it's good to see you and good to be with you. Uh, just for the rest of your class here, I want you to know that your, your instructor, Mr. Smith, Mark Smith, was a college student when I first ran for Congress and worked on my first congressional campaign when he was a college student at Graceland College in Lamoni, Iowa. So uh, we go back a long, long way. Uh, and I just want to state that for the record. But what I'd like to do is just kind of go over a little bit, a little bit of the history of the ADA and sort of some, some of the philosophy behind it, and then open it up for questions. I'd rather, rather respond to what you're interested in. And I saw some of the questions that were already kind of formulated and sent to me, so I have some idea of what you want to cover. Uh, I understand that most of you watch the movie Crip Camp. Is that correct? Am I coming through? Yes, coming we can hear through. you fine. I slow, yeah, I was slow on the microphone, Senator. Yes, uh, the assignment was for uh, last Tuesday for folks to have watched Crip Camp. And uh, so they did. Good. Okay, well, that is a great movie. And it does give you some idea of the genesis of what I call the disability rights movement in America. Um, so as you can see, this kind of started in the 60s. What propelled it at that time, uh, more than anything else, was the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which is, you know, a federal law that bans discrimination on the basis of race, sex, color, religion, national origin, but not disability. So disability leaders, some of those you saw in the movie, began to say, what about us? <laughs> We're being discriminated against all the time, and we're not included in the Civil Rights Bill. So thus began a long-term effort to have a broad Civil Rights Bill that would cover all persons with all forms of disabilities. Uh, it, it, it started slow. They, moved, they got moving in the late 60s, early 70s. There were two pieces of legislation that they were able to get past. One was the uh, Rehabilitation Act of 1973, Section 504, uh, which you can look up, which basically defines what a disability is and prohibits discrimination in federal, uh, uh, in the federal government on the basis of, of disability. The second bill was the Education of All Handicapped Children's Act that was actually passed when I got to Congress, 1975. And uh, that was based on a court case called Park v. Pennsylvania, P-A-R-C, Pennsylvania Association of Retarded Citizens versus Pennsylvania, uh, which went to the circuit court level. The Supreme Court uh, let it stand. And it basically said that if a state provides a free public education uh, to the children of that state, then that state must also provide a free, appropriate public education for kids with disabilities. 
that never happened before. So that was a court case. So based on Park v. Pennsylvania and another case uh, that was accompanying that in the District of Columbia, uh, uh, schools then began to understand that, and school boards understood that they had to provide education for kids with disabilities. Well, that sort of limped along. Uh, bits and pieces here and there, different states enacted different laws. But at that time, my focus when I was in the House was on, on deafness and communication. Uh, my older brother, Frank, was deaf. And that's where I learned about discrimination against persons with disabilities. I saw how he'd been discriminated against in his lifetime, uh, where he couldn't go to a school. He was sent to the Iowa School for the Deaf and Dumb. That's what it was called. Uh, but as my brother told me one time, he said, I may be deaf, but I'm not dumb. But that's the way they treated people with disabilities. Uh, and, and my brother was told he couldn't do what he wanted to do. He, he had to be a baker or a shoe cobbler or, or a printer's assistant. Well, he said he didn't want to be any of those things. So the Iowa School for the Deaf said, okay, we're going to make you a baker. So he became a baker. But that's not what he wanted to do. So his schooling was limited. His education was limited. His horizons were limited. His future was limited. And he couldn't do what he wanted to do. And then I saw how he was discriminated against in employment, how he was discriminated against when he tried to get a driver's license, uh, even things like shopping in a store where people wouldn't wait on him. Um, I remember once being in a, in a store with my brother, Frank, and he was looking for something and a, a clerk came up and said, may I help you? And I said, well, my brother here is looking for something. And she then turned to him and started to speak to him and Frank said, and wrote down, I'm deaf, can't hear, please write it down. So then she started talking to me as though he wasn't even there. <laughs> like he didn't even exist. Uh, I said, well, don't talk to me, talk to him. He'll write it down, you write it down for him and ask him, don't ask me. So it's just, it was the kind of attitudes that people had, that if you were a person with a disability, especially an intellectual disability, that you were to be taken care of sheltered away from society uh, and treated with patronizing attitudes. Well, the disability rights community then began in earnest in the eighties to demonstrate the need for a comprehensive piece of legislation. Things like lying underneath the wheels of Greyhound buses so the buses couldn't move. Uh, Sit-ins around buildings with, with, that weren't accessible. Uh, I, I will tell you this, I, 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 the, the, the disability rights movement learned a lot from the, from the uh, civil rights movement of the late 50s and 60s when African Americans were demonstrating for their rights, their civil rights. So the disability community did a lot of that, a lot of demonstrations, getting arrested a lot, stopping buses from running, just different things. Uh, I remember one time when they chained themselves in wheelchairs across Independence Avenue in Washington, D.C. At, at the rush hour and stopped all the traffic in Washington, D.C. once. Well, then I go to the Senate in 1985. In 1986, 87, I become chair of the Disability Committee, a subcommittee uh, that Ted Kennedy, uh, the chair of the committee, had fashioned for me and uh, and made me the chair of the disability committee. And so then in 1988, we introduced our first version of the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, it was actually, I was not the chief sponsor. The chief sponsor at that time was Lowell Weicker from Connecticut, a Republican. I was his chief co-sponsor. And in the house, it was Tony Coelho from California. So I began having hearings in my disability committee on changing and acting a broad-based civil rights law. Well, 1988 was short-lived. Uh, the elections were held. Lowell Weicker lost his re-election. Tony Coelho left the House for other reasons. So now we're into 1989. And so I took the bill. I redrafted it. I introduced it with 
uh, under my name with uh, uh, Dave Durenberger, a senator from Minnesota, and on the House side, Major Owens, and a congressman from New York. We passed our bill. I uh, had all kinds of hearings on this. Uh, people with physical disabilities, intellectual disabilities, developmental disabilities. Um, we had businesses in to talk about it. So in September of 1989, we passed our bill in the Senate. It went to the House, got bollocked up in the House. They couldn't get it through. Now we're into 1990, and we wanted to get it done before the 1990 election. So we're now into March of 1998, 1990. It's stuck in the House. And then a wonderful, marvelous thing happened. Uh, some disability advocates got together, a small group of them, rolled their, and called the press and said they were going to have this massive demonstration in front of the Capitol. Well, the press turned out for it, but there was only about 15 people in wheelchairs. But what they did is they rolled their wheelchairs up to the steps of the Capitol, fell out of their wheelchairs, and crawled up the Capitol steps as a demonstration that that was the only way they could get into the United States Capitol. Well, the TV camera was rolling. It was on the evening news. It got broadcast all over America. <laughs> there was some wonderful. There was a wonderful clip of this young girl. Um, sorry, I just dropped her name, Jennifer. She was eight years old, crawling up the steps of the Capitol. A policeman came up to stop her, and she said, "Why don't you stop those people walking up the Capitol steps? This is the only way I can go up it." Wow! Now that hit like a thunderbolt in the House of Representatives. And shortly after that, we passed it in the House. Uh, we worked out a few differences and, uh, and President Bush signed it into law on July 26, 1990. So again, it's a broad civil rights bill, four goals of the ADA, full participation, equal opportunity, independent living, economic self-sufficiency. Well, how have we done? Well, on participation, we've done, we've done, we've made some great progress in the last 31 years. Uh, same in terms of equal opportunity. Independent living, uh, we've made some progress in that too. The last one, economic self-sufficiency is the one that we have fallen way behind on. And there are five titles in the Americans with Disabilities Act as I drafted it. And I made certain that the first title was employment because I felt that was the most important thing that we could address, employment. Well, but after what happened was in 1999, the Supreme Court uh, made a decision that just screwed up everything in terms of employment. And then it took us eight years till 2008 to pass the ADA Act amendments to straighten it out and tell the Supreme Court, here's what we meant. So 2009, we have had some clear, uh, clear provisions on what to do on employment. So we're making some progress, but it still is, is the one area that we have basically not made any progress on. And that's what I spend most of my time working on uh, now that I'm retired. I might just add a couple of things. I got two other bills that I sponsored passed in 1990. It was a good year for me. So we got the Americans with Disabilities Act. I was the chief sponsor. Then we passed another bill that I had been working on for, oh, I guess I've been working on it for about four or five years. It's called the TV Decoder and Circuitry Act. So as you know right now, uh, if you hit your mute button on your TV, you get closed captions, right? Well, at that time, uh, we couldn't do that. We had a box that would decode it, uh, but it was cumbersome and expensive. But then I found out that you could make a chip the size of your thumbnail to put it in a TV set and it would decode uh, and put on the screen uh, closed captions. So I had hearings, I drafted a bill, and we mandated, get this, mandated that every television set sold in America 
with a size 13 inch screen or bigger had to have that decoding chip put in the TV set. And the rest is history. Uh, I remember having a hearing and people say, well, that's gonna increase the cost of TV sets. And I checked with the chip manufacturers and they said, well, yeah, if you only make one or 10 or a hundred, but if you make millions, it's almost nothing. So now we have closed captions globally. The second thing I got passed was my bill, the IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which took the former Education of Handicapped Children's Act, brought it up to date, and we mandated, again, mandated in it, certain things for the rights of parents whose kids were in school and who were in an IEP, an individual education program. So IDEA was passed the same year, 1990. So all of those together basically uh, has led us to the point where I think what, what my vision was for the ADA was to break down the physical barriers and to hopefully start breaking down the attitudinal barriers that people had about persons with disabilities. The attitudes that if you have a disability, you're limited. If you have a disability, uh, don't expect too much. Uh, the attitude that if, uh, that if you had a disability, you had to just be grateful for whatever society is giving you. Well, hopefully we're breaking down those attitudes. And now people with disabilities are being seen that, hey, especially with the advent of new technologies and breaking down the physical barriers, we're finding that people with disabilities can just about do what anybody else can do. And they can do it in the workplace or in education, health, anywhere. So my vision was for a barrier-free world, a barrier-free in terms of physical barriers and barrier-free in terms of attitudinal barriers. Well, have we gotten there? We've made progress. The United Nations, uh, a delegation of the United Nations came to see me in 2001, and they were beginning to draft a United Nations provision on the rights of persons with disabilities. They copied it after the Americans with Disabilities Act, and they promulgated it. And I, if I, my memory serves me right, they got it passed in and promulgated around 2007, eight. And all of the nations, all the countries have signed on to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, except three countries. Guess which is one of those three? The United States. And I'll be glad to answer questions about that, but it is stuck in my craw that here we are, it's, it's modeled after the ADA, but some right-wing people in the Senate will not, will not permit it. Now, President Obama signed it, but under our constitution, the Senate has to approve it. So even though the president signed it, the Senate still has never approved it because of the filibuster. So with that, I'll bring it to a close and try to open some questions. Uh, am I still coming through? You are coming through loud and clear. Yeah, thank you, Senator. Uh, so we'll go uh, to questions from the students. Thank you uh, for that introduction. And Catherine is first. And Thanks. we'll on the uh, on the uh, questions, we'll have the students state their name and then give the question. Hello. OK, you can hear me. Hello, Senator Harkin. This is Catherine. Um, my question is, the ADA was the biggest milestone for Americans with disabilities. But still, the U.S. Census Bureau found that full-time, year-round U.S. workers with disabilities earned 87 cents for every dollar earned by those without disabilities. Also, 59% of Americans with disabilities live in households with income that is less than $25,000 a year. What further steps need to be taken in the legislation, not only to gain equality, but equity for disabled Americans? And what would that legisl legislation need to include? Well, you pointed out again one of the one of the enduring problems that we have, and that is that uh, people with disabilities are not being employed. Uh, I, I think uh, legislatively, I think what we need to do is to first of all uh, raise the minimum wage. 
Secondly, get rid of this concept of a sub-minimum wage for persons with disabilities. Uh, there are many persons with disabilities working now in sub-minimum wage jobs that pay as little as a couple of bucks an hour. That it, with the proper training and the proper support uh, can be engaged in what we call competitive integrated employment. Competitive integrated employment, employment right alongside everyone else. Um, now, I know some of you may think, well, there are some persons with disabilities so severe that they'll not be able to work. Well, you're right. But that ought to be the last stop, not the first. Right now, if you're a young person with a disability, on, and basically the first stop has always been what we call a sheltered workshop, a sub-minimum wage job, a dead-end job with no hope for advancement. Well, I, I tried to change that before I left the Senate in the Workforce uh, Investment and Opportunity Act passed in 2014, the last bill I got passed, to change how kids with disabilities who are on IEPs, individual education programs in school, that they can't go in, they can't go into sub-minimum wage jobs. And there have to be transition um, support uh, for kids that are on IEPs to get summer jobs, uh, after school jobs, weekend jobs, uh, job shadowing. Uh, you know, I, I'll bet everyone I'm talking to in this class, when you were in high school, I bet you had a summer job. I'll bet you had a weekend job, something like that. But kids with disabilities never get those jobs, so they don't have a work experience. So I tried to break that down, and it, it is being broken down. We're getting now, we're getting uh, voc rehab to work to uh, get kids with disabilities into those kind of summer after school jobs to get work experience. In fact, I set aside 15% of all of the federal money that goes to a state like Iowa for vocational rehabilitation. 15% has to be used for these transition services. Uh, now, some states are better than others. Under David Mitchell, uh, our director of voc rehab in Iowa, we've done great. We've been really doing good stuff in that. Uh, some states just aren't doing. So the steps that need to be taken, as I said, raise the minimum wage, uh, do more affirmative action for employers, uh, to reach out to uh, the disability community, uh, to hire persons with disabilities. Uh, I've even looked at certain tax benefits that an employer might get if in fact they hire someone who has a disability, who qualifies for disability support, uh, uh, to encourage them to hire more persons with disabilities in competitive integrated employment. Uh, third, uh, we need to uh, change the, uh, some of the systems in Medicaid so that if a person with a disability works, their health benefits are not reduced when they get a job. That has been a, a, a lingering problem uh, in that regard uh, because of the way the Medicaid system is set up. So those are just the things I would think about right now that would help increase the income of persons with disabilities and also to open doors of, uh, of, of employment uh, for persons with disabilities. All right, thank you. Uh, next up is Claudia. Hello. Hello, Senator Harkin. It's really nice to meet you. My name is Claudia, and my question is a little bit more personal. Um, do you think your brother Frank would be proud of the job you have accomplished? And do you feel personally satisfied of the work that was done? And would you have done something differently? Well, my brother Frank uh, has passed away uh, due to cancer. Uh, well, I think he would be. Proud, you know, when I uh, <laughs> two funny stories. Uh, when I, when I got the ADA passed and we were on the floor of the Senate for the passage, 
I gave my speech in ASL, ASL, sign language. Uh, <laughs> and so my brother, I knew, was watching it. So that's why I did it, so that he would understand what we were doing. We didn't have all our closed captions at that time, you know. Uh, the other funny story is when I got sworn into the Senate in 1985, I had my family there, my brother Frank, and I had worked an agreement uh, for my family to sit in the gallery and watch my swearing in and my brother Frank, and I got an interpreter from Gallaudet to come and interpret for him while he was sitting in the gallery. Well, I got them all seated in the gallery. I go back down to the floor and we're just about to be sworn in. Uh, we go up to the front and we get sworn in, kind of a nice formal process. All of a sudden, my one of my brothers, a hearing brother, John, came down and asked for me and the doorman came in and got me. And he told me that the doorkeeper <laughs> up in the, up in the uh, uh, gallery, would not let the interpreter interpret for my brother. So I didn't know what to do. So I went to see, then the Republicans were in charge of the Senate. So Senator Dole, Bob Dole was the uh, majority leader. And who, by the way, uh, I just saw yesterday, he's 98 years old. I just went, he's quite ill, but I just went to see him yesterday uh, here in Washington. Um, but so I went to see Senator Dole and I told him what had happened. So he got his staff person, sent him up there and said, you tell them that I told them that they got to let the interpreter in. And so my brother got to have the interpreter there because of Bob Dole. And Bob Dole became one of our great supporters of the ADA uh, later on when we were working on it. So yeah, I think he'd be pretty proud of it. I, what was the other thing he said? Oh, oh uh, um, you wanted to know uh, would I have done something? Do I feel sat Do I feel satisfied? Pretty much so, except that I'm really still upset about the employment aspect of it, uh, and uh, and the fact there are two things that I'm still upset about: employment and housing. Housing, and I'll, if you have any questions about that, I, I'd like to respond because uh, it's it's just terrible what's happening in housing. Um, uh, would I have done some things differently? Wouldn't we all do some things differently if we could? But I mean, would, I would have done them differently if I were a dictator and I could write out exactly what I wanted and make it law. But, <laughs> but in passing laws, you know, you have to make compromises. And so, uh, yeah, on the one hand, would I have done something differently if I could have absolute uh, control and do what I wanted? But would I do it differently if I had to do things and do it with the compromises? Probably not. I think that's the best we got. In fact, I will tell you this to all of you students there. I get asked this question a lot. Could we pass the Americans with Disabilities Act today in the present Congress? I have one short answer. No, there is no way that we would ever get the Americans with Disabilities Act through this Congress in the form that we got it through in 1990, and that is a sad commentary on the way our Congress is operating right now. All right, next up is uh, Diana. Hi, my name is Diana, and the question I have for you today is, what was the experience like with your colleagues, um, those who may have opposed the ADA to be passed? Interesting. <laughs> they were all interesting. One in particular was a senator by the name of Jesse Helms from North Carolina, who was a constant thorn in our side. And at that time, we were, uh, as you know, there was a, a, a quite an outbreak of AIDS. And people were afraid that People with AIDS then would be disabled and you couldn't protect against it. It's just crazy stuff. But Jesse Helms was always trying to thwart us and stop us. Uh, but we got around him. Uh, and there were a few others. 
uh, we worked, we got the U.S. Chamber of Commerce on our side, thanks in large part to Senator Dole and Durenberger, my chief co-sponsor and some Republicans and, we, and uh, 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 several others. But we got the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. But there's, some, there's an organization called the NFIB, the National Federation of Independent Businesses. NFIB. And I'm sure if you go out to any small town in Iowa and go up down the main street, you'll see the little thing in the window, member of the NFIB. The National Federation of Independent Businesses never supported the ADA. Never. And they never supported the ADA Act amendments in 2008. They were a real thorn in our side because they were out in congressional districts in small towns and communities saying, oh, this is gonna hurt them. They'd have to spend all this money and blah, blah, blah. They became a real roadblock for us uh, in, in getting this passed. Uh, uh, perhaps one of the most interesting roadblocks we had was President Bush's chief of staff. Now, President Bush, President George H.W. Bush was always in favor of the ADA. He was very strong on it never wavered, but he had a chief of staff by the name of John Sununu, who had been governor of New Hampshire. And Sununu was tied in with the NFIB. And even though his boss was in favor of it, he was trying to undercut us every step of the way. In fact, uh, I once had a conversation with President Bush in the White House, a private conversation, uh, I'm not going to go into it. It's an interesting story, uh, but it happened in an, in the private residence elevator. Uh, and I said to the president, I said, you know, I know this has been a social event, but do you mind if I bring up something? He said, sure. and, and, and President Bush was what? He was just a really wonderful person. And he said, sure, what is it? So I told him about his chief of staff undercutting us. So then he assigned his legal counsel, Boyden Gray, to take charge of the ADA rather than his chief of staff. And with that, we got it done. Uh, interesting play of personalities there. All right, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> uh, Senator, the next questioner was going to be Josie. And Josie texted me today and said that she has strep throat. And so... Oh. Uh, she's doing the responsible thing and wants to make sure that she sees the recording later, but isn't here. So Aaron is going to ask the or ask the uh, question for Josie. Um, yeah, good morning, Senator. Um, so good do you morning. think the ADA legislation would have been possible without the involvement and the solidarity of the past camp goers from Camp Jeanette? No. Uh, as I'm telling you, in the 60s, 70s, it began to build up. In the 80s, the, the uh, solidarity among the disability community became quite strong. And the demonstrations and the things they did began to open people's eyes uh, as to the discrimination. Uh, I mentioned the Capitol crawl as sort of being the culmination uh, of all of this. But you know, people like Judy Human and, and, and uh, 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 oh gosh, uh, so many uh, others uh, that I, some are, she's still alive, but others that are now gone. Uh, uh, Ed Roberts uh, was just so wonderful and uh, Justin Dart. Uh, no, the, 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 without that solidarity, we, we never could have gotten it done. But I will add one one little caveat to that. When we were finally pulling the ADA bill together and I was ready to bring it out on the floor, we had some disability groups that still weren't agreeing. <laughs> so I remember I got them all in a room one day in my big hearing room. It's a big hearing room in the Dirksen building. And I had Bobby Silverstein, my chief of my staff person, uh, on disability. And I got them all in this room and I said, look, we've been working on this now for three years. We've massaged it. We've reached compromises. 
I think we have enough support on the Republican side and others to, to get this thing passed now. We can overcome Jesse Helms. Uh, we have the Chamber of Commerce. I said, but we've got to have the disability community together. And I said, look, I'm going to leave this room. And in about an hour, I'm going to come back. And in one hour from now, either you're all going to agree to sign on this bill, or I'm not going to go forward with it. I'm going to stop it. Up to you. I, a little bit of theatrics involved. Okay, give me a break. A little bit of theatrics. So I, so I, left, the, I left the room. I came back an hour later. And, and Bobby Silverstein said, well, yes. I said, okay. We all agree. This is it. Yes. Okay. Sign off on it. So they all marched up and signed off on, on the bill. <laughs> so sometimes it takes a little bit of action like that to, to bring people together. But the short answer, that's a long one. Without what they did in the 80s, the demonstrations, the going to jail, ADAPT, you should know about ADAPT, A-D-A-P-T, and, um, and Bob Kafka, Bob Kafka. Uh, I always refer to them as our Marines. They hit the beach first. They were always getting arrested. I think Bob's been arrested 40 some times. Um, and um, again, uh, they, they really got the conscience of people in America thinking about, about breaking down these barriers and having a civil rights bill for persons with disabilities. All right, thank you. Um, next up is uh, Toshin. Thank you very much, um, Senator. Uh, you want to, I really, I personally want to say that what you have done is not only for America. I'm going to remove this. <laughs> what you have done is not only for America, but is it has a global impact because America remains um, an example for the world and people want to do what you do. So uh, we really want to appreciate you. I have two questions, but I'm going to go with the first one right now. Uh, and the question is, what can we do to influence the expansion of Medicaid funding criteria? at the federal level to accommodate persons living with disabilities who will love to work at least 30 hours and still be able to cover their medication and therapy fee? That's a great question. And I think I may have mentioned earlier, it's one of the things that still be devilous. Uh, and that is uh, you qualify for Medicaid, uh, SSDI, for example, as a, a, dis a person with a disability. But if you work, then your benefits get cut. Now, we did uh, pass uh, legislation that allows states to buy in, allows states to permit persons with disabilities who make over the income level to buy in to Medicaid. I was one of those. Not all the states do this. And, and the states vary. Uh, in Iowa, we do allow, we were one of the early implementers of the buy-in program, but it's still limited. It, 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 uh, uh, I, think, I think the Iowa law is, maybe Mr. Smith, maybe you can help me out here. I think it's 150%. Yeah, I believe that that is correct, that it goes up to 150% of the poverty level. That's right. That, that's all. Well, that's not very much. <laughs> that, that's that's not a great deal. Some states go to two hundred percent and more, uh, but I think uh, I, I think the federal poverty level right now is about what twelve thousand a year. I think that's correct. Yeah, something yeah, like this for a single person. Yes, for for a single person. Uh, so you can see, uh, one hundred fifty percent doesn't get you very far. So, uh, look, you asked me what could be done. The simplest, the best thing that we could do as a nation to simplify, save money overall uh, in this regard is to have national health insurance, to have a national health care program. 
rather than the convoluted system we have now, where you have state, and you have federal, you have private, uh, I'm telling you, it just gets all bollocked up. And people with disabilities get caught uh, in this thing. Well, the state doesn't want to fund it that much. And the federal government can only do its part. So you have Medicaid, which is a state federal uh, 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 marriage, if you want to say that way. The best thing we could do is if we had a national health program, you don't have all these rules and regulations and hoops you got to jump through. It would save a ton of money, believe me. Now, who would suffer if we passed national health insurance? Insurance companies. Now, I don't mean to go off on this tangent, but I've been on the health committee for, well, I was on it for 30, almost 30 years, and I chaired it after Senator Kennedy died. And uh, I can tell you that the health, the health system in America, the healthcare system in America today is basically set up for the providers and the insurance companies. That's it. It's basically set up for providers and insurance companies. It should be set up for the recipients, <laughs> the people who need health care, for prevention and wellness, and yes, for curative, uh, you know, for curative procedures. But it's basically set up to protect the insurance companies more than anything else. Well, you know, I don't. I don't want you to think I don't believe in insurance. I have car insurance. I have house insurance. I have life insurance. What else do I have? I probably have some other insurance I don't know about. So insurance is good for a lot of things, for risk avoidance, for risk insurance. Insurance is fine, but not for health. Not for health. Because you never know when you might get sick, when you might have an accident, when you might become disabled. Uh, I just spent some time the other day with a retired federal judge who, and she uh, had an accident, a car accident, and became paraplegic. It just happens in an instant sometimes. You can't insure for that, that kind of thing. It shouldn't. There's, a, there's one principle of insurance uh, that I learned a long time ago, and it's this principle. The more people in the pool, the cheaper it is for everyone. That is true of auto insurance or house insurance or any kind of insurance. The more people in the pool, cheaper it is for everybody. Well, in health insurance, we have so many different pools, you can't believe it. We need everybody in one big pool, cheaper for everybody. And believe me, in terms of people with disabilities, it would be a godsend and it would save us a ton of money uh, in our country. Now, aside from that, I realize we're not practically going to get that now. We need states like Iowa to increase that to at least 200% of poverty, to take off some of the asset limitations that we have, to make it easier for a person with a disability to apply for uh, that buy-in program so that they won't lose any of their Medicaid uh, support systems uh, if they do get a job. Now that's practical. We can do that at the state of Iowa level. If, if I could, I wanted to add to, uh, just because I'm not sure the class understands about asset uh, limitations. If you are uh, in a nursing home in Iowa and you are on Medicaid as uh, paying for the care in that facility, uh, usually Medicare and no, sorry, just Medicaid uh, paying for that. There's a limitation that you can have no more than $2,500. Um, and so uh, that a, is very restrictive. Uh, other programs in Iowa on the Medicaid program have a little more on the asset limitation, but that excludes a good number of people who meet the income guidelines and don't meet the asset guidelines. All that's right. correct. That's correct. Yeah. That's, that's Did correct. you want to say more, Senator? I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I, for, I forgot what the asset limitation was in Iowa on that. I'm sorry, Mark. I can't remember, but it is it's not very much more. What? 
Yeah. Well, let's move on. Let's move on. Yeah, I can't it, find it. I it, can't. It is it. low, and I and I actually was trying to find that the other day and didn't find it. I do know it's two thousand five hundred for nursing homes, but I don't know what it is for people living in the community. So, all right, we'll move to Chad for a question. Good morning, Senator. My name is Chad. Um, my question is: When the ADA was signed into law, I was about twelve years old. A few family members of mine were Rush Limbaugh radio listeners. And I remember a lot of anger about the <laughs> past. Could you explain what some of this anger was about or what the arguments were against the bill? <laughs> oh, I remember it well. Oh, Rush Limbaugh was on me all the time. <laughs> and, 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 and he fanned the flames for the NFIB. They were together in this. And basically it was small businesses were going to have this burden. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and that individuals now would, would uh, uh, have to pay through taxes for different changes that they didn't much need. I remember he went after curb cuts one time, doing these curb cuts for people with wheelchairs. Well, that's not a big deal. People with wheelchair can go up there and you can hold on the wheelchair and get them over that curb. But we're gonna pay all these taxes to have all this done. <laughs> Yeah. The curb cuts weren't just for people with, with wheelchairs. It also helped parents with baby carriages and everything else. <laughs> so I remember uh, people going after it, but that was it. They, they didn't want to be told that they had to do certain things and break down certain barriers. Even with the fact that we put in the tax code, um, a tax uh, benefit, uh, 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 a tax credit for small businesses that had to widen their doors or put in a bathroom or that was accessible or whatever. Um, they got up to a 50% of the cost of that modification paid for by with a tax credit. A lot of them didn't know that. Uh, but I think that was it, is that, that again, people thought, Look, I'm a generous person. I'm a religious person. I feel sorry for people with disabilities and we'll take care of them. That's what we've done for the last thousand years. We'll put them in an institution. We'll take care of them. They don't have to worry. And quite frankly, a lot of good people, you know, it's not this way. They, they, they didn't, it wasn't mean spirited. It's just they thought that persons with disabilities should be charitable. You give them charity. You take care of them. But people with disabilities were saying, we don't want to be taken care of. We want to be able to experience life. We want to work. We want to travel. We want to go to restaurants. Uh, we want to shop. I remember a young woman in Des Moines, Danetta. Uh, uh, and she testified, I had her testify before my committee, uh, had cerebral palsy. And I remember uh, asking her uh, about, you know, the ADA and what, it, what we're going to do with it and how it was going to do this and that. She said, that's all fine. That's all fine. But she said, all I want to really do is to be able to go out and buy a pair of shoes like anybody else. Well, you know, that kind of broke it down. It's just letting people with disabilities experience life. So I think we had segments. We had like the small business community up in arms because they were going to have to do certain things. Uh, we had restaurant owners who didn't want people with disabilities in their restaurant because it would scare away other people. Uh, and then we had a good segment of our population, as I just said, well-meaning good-hearted people who just felt that people with disabilities ought to be, quote, taken care of. Um, I wanted to go back here to uh, something previous because Wynn, uh, who's been wonderful helping put this presentation together, just handed me the, or the resource limitations or the asset limitations. Um, and unfortunately, it's worse than I thought it was. Um, <laughs> 
So for a single person in a nursing home, it's $2,000 uh, per month. Uh, and if they're participating a single person in the Medicaid waiver program, uh, is this better if I take my mask off, Senator? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah thank yeah. you. Yeah. So uh, on institutional nursing care uh, for a single person, $2,000. Medicaid uh, waiver program uh, for home and community-based services, 2,000, and regular Medicaid, 2,000. Now, if a married couple, both of them are applying for these services, the, in, or the, re, the um, asset limitation is $3,000. So $1,000 um, yeah. more uh, for that. And then if, if you have a married couple and one spouse is receiving the services, it's a $2,000 limitation um, for uh, the institutional care and for Medicaid uh, waiver and uh, 3,000 for regular Medicaid. But the spouse, the non-participating spouse has an income limitation on the nursing, or uh, sorry, an asset limitation for nursing care and for uh, Medicaid waiver services of uh, $130,380. Uh, so there's some break when one person needs the services, one spouse needs them, the other does not uh, need them. Um, but still um, very concerning on those levels for people who are participating in services. So. All right, we have finished round one of questions. So let's go to round two. Uh, and the first one up is Diana. Hi again. Um, so my second question here is, um, do you think if leaders of the US weren't so focused on financial concerns that it would have gotten gone to passage of the ADA earlier, early on? Um, well, let's see, I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, financial concerns. Again, keep in mind that for time immemorial, persons with disabilities, intellectual disabilities, developmental disabilities, physical disabilities, were always thought uh, as there was something wrong with them they need to be fixed they needed and needed to be isolated from society and needed charity so all of our religious institutions were basically set up to provide charity to persons with disabilities and that's what they taught they taught people to be charitable towards persons with disabilities that they need to be taken care of so you have that attitude so prevalent in the united states uh, 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 among all charitable organizations. Uh, and then you have the business community that basically has the attitude that a person with a disability simply can't be productive. Can't be productive. So they should just be taken care of. We don't, we don't need them in the workplace because they can't produce anything. Uh, Financial concerns, well, I think there's been, there was a lot of thought that, that by breaking down some of these barriers, it was going to cost a lot of money uh, tax-wise, uh, that we're going to pay more taxes to, to do these things, but it would only benefit a small number of people, people with disabilities. So I think that was sort of the, what the leaders were kind of focused on uh, more than anything. Uh, this compels me at this moment to tell you another story about my brother, Frank, and what got me thinking about employment. So he got out of baking and he got a job at a small manufacturing place in West Des Moines, Iowa. And the person, the owner of the plant, they employed about 200 and some people. And they made nozzles for jet engines, like for Pratt & Whitney and General Electric for jet engines. Uh, and it was a very intricate job. You had to use these drilling machines that would do just very fine little drilling and that type of stuff. Well, the owner of the plant got to know Frank at the bake shop. One day he asked Frank, you always write it out because he couldn't talk to him because my brother was deaf. He 
said, how do you like baking? And my brother said, I hate it. <laughs> and he said, well, what do you want to do? And he said, my brother said, I like to work with machines. I'm good at that. That's what I like to do. Well, the owner said, well, that's what I do. I own a plant like that. So he hired Frank, took, him, took Frank down to the plant and said to his foreman, give Harkin a job here. Find out what he can do. Now, Mr. Delavan, whom I did not know then, but got to know later, told me, look, I just hired Frank out of the goodness of my heart. I felt sorry for him. He didn't like baking, uh, baking and so I thought maybe I'd give him something to do. So he said about a month or so later, I came down to the shop floor and I asked my foreman how Harkin was doing. And the foreman said, wow, this guy's amazing. He's always at work on time, cleans up his workspace when he's done. Uh, he puts out more parts per hour than anybody else and makes fewer mistakes than anyone else on the line. Well, Mr. Delvin said, I found that very interesting. So we begin to observe Frank and his work. And what, it, what occurred to them, what finally dawned on him was this was a very noisy place. Bells ringing, things clanging, people shouting, drills going. But my brother was deaf, didn't bother him a bit. He just kept right on working on his job where other people would get disturbed or yell or something like that. So Mr. Dillon told me several years later when I finally met him, he said, you know, based on that, I went out and hired more deaf people. Not because of, I felt sorry for him because it was better for my bottom line. I made more money. I got more parts produced and had fewer mistakes and fewer turnover. I didn't have people leaving the jobs they worked there. Well, I have found this to be true all across America, that when businesses have hired persons with disabilities and they give them a modicum of, of, a modicum of support, whatever it might be, they get the best workers, the most productive workers, workers who are loyal, who stay on the job, and they save a ton of money on training. I can give you example after example after example of this. So again, what people with disabilities have shown is they can be just as productive as anyone else, sometimes with a small amount of modification. And as you know, in the ADA, we have a provision that says that businesses must provide reasonable accommodations reasonable accommodations for a person with a disability. So again, <laughs> financial concerns, it was all of those things, okay? It was all of those things. Thank you. All right, next up is a second question from Catherine. Oh, <laughs> I was confused in what I wrote here for the person questioning. Okay. Um, on the topic of housing, uh, landlords are responsible for paying for accommodations for people with disabilities through many common ones are free or low cost, providing larger print documents or a designated parking spot, while tenants are usually responsible for paying for structural modifications unless the dwelling is listed as a federally assisted housing structure. This would be like wider door frames or ramps. Meanwhile, the average one bedroom apartment rent with wheelchair accessibility in Iowa City is $1,300 a month. This puts those with disabilities, especially in Iowa City, at a disadvantage financially. Now here's the question. Uh, is there any way through legislation to make a law that requires disability accommodated housing cost, uh, sorry, to cost the same amount as those that are only accessible by able-bodied people? Is this possi possible or likely to happen? Another thing that's bedeviled me for all these years, uh, again, in the ADA, again, keep in mind, we had to make compromises. But one of the compromises we made was on housing. And we did get the provision in the ADA that mandated that all new buildings in America, after the passage of ADA, all new buildings had to meet ADA accessibility standards but only buildings that are provide uh, public accommodations where, where the public can come in and out of uh, <clears throat> restaurants, um, 
uh, in any kind of business where the where the public can come in and out of uh, has to have accessibility standards. But we couldn't get housing. The housing industry was opposed. The realtors were opposed. So we really couldn't do much with housing. So what we did is we passed a Fair Housing Act after that. And we did focus in the Fair Housing Act uh, on certain multifamily dwellings and others like that. Um, but um, it, it, it's, not, it's not as good as public accommodations. Let me put it that way. Uh, I have advocated for years that we need to incorporate housing into the ADA so that all new housing be built with accessible standards, multifamily as well as single family housing. Well, the realtors basically are still not up to that. Here's what I propose. Um, think about this. One of the biggest drivers in persons owning their own homes in America, one of the biggest drivers is the deductibility of interest payments you make on your mortgage. So let's you go out and you, you go out and buy a house or a condominium. It could be a multifamily unit. You have a condominium. You buy that, you get a mortgage. As you know, for the first 10 years or so, almost all the house payments you make go for interest payments. Okay, but now that has enabled Americans to become homeowners, which is a good thing. What I have advocated now is that after a period of time, say three years, four years, that we have in the law that if you are purchasing a house and think about a house as a condo also, it could be a condominium, could be in a multifamily housing thing, that if you buy some and you want to deduct your interest payments from your taxes, that unit or that house you're buying must be accessible, must meet ADA accessibility standards. Well, what would happen is that builders now, seeing a whole new market, would say, hey, we got to start building houses that are accessible. Or people building new apartments and things like that, that they would say, well, if we want to sell them, people are going to want to, are not going to buy it if they can't deduct their interest payments. So now we have to start building things that are accessible. Well, now, I've advocated that. We haven't gotten anywhere on it, but I still think that would be the kind of jolt we would need to start making housing accessible. I can tell you that if you're building multifamily housing, the cost for making all of the units, not just the ones on the first floor. By the way, the Fair Housing Act does say that if you're building a multifamily housing unit, and it's three or four or five or six stories, something like that. All only the bottom floor units need to be accessible. Well, that kind of limits it, doesn't it? Well, I think all units should be accessible. Uh, and the cost of doing that in the beginning is either minimal or not even existent. It just has to do with how you design things. We call it universal design. Design a bathroom with a bigger door. Design a bathroom with turning space for a, for a wheelchair. Uh, 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 designing entry doors uh, that are accessible. It, it, it just doesn't cost that much more to do it. Uh, if you do it from the very beginning, it's retrofitting that costs a lot of, a lot of money. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we do need to make changes in our housing laws uh, so that we get more and more affordable housing. I, I just recently, I'm sorry, it was last year, 2020, I uh, was introduced to a young woman in Washington, DC, uses a wheelchair. Uh, she is a, not only a college graduate, I think she has a master's, she's a master's degree. She has a very good job in Washington, DC at very high pay. 
she told me that she spent over two years looking for uh, a, uh, an accessible condominium for her to purchase that would be accessible for her wheelchair. So the, the, um, uh, the, the number of units that, that, are, that are available are so small that people with disabilities have a hard time finding them. And that is doubly true for low income. If you are a low income family and you have a child with a disability and you're trying to find low, low income housing, you could search for years and not find something that's, that's accessible. I see this in Iowa a lot uh, uh, where a low income family is trying to find something. They have a child with a disability. They need some accessibility standards, but they can't find it. And they're on a waiting list for sometimes for a long time. So again, I love the question. Uh, the answer basically is we need to make housing accessible, period. That's all. And if it's accessible, I've always argued to the realtors, that means you've got a bigger market. Right now, if you have a house that is not accessible and you're trying to sell it, no one with a disability is involved as is, is part of your market. If it was accessible, your market is bigger. It seems to me a seller wants the biggest market possible, it would seem to me. So I think it's just, again, one of those things where people haven't thought about it and they haven't thought it through that universal design is beneficial to everyone. Senator. Yeah, thank you, Senator. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm goofing you up because I know you're following along on the written copy, uh, as are the students here. And so I slipped to number three on the questions and uh, omitted question number two on the second round. So Aaron, for uh, filling in for Josie on uh, question number two. Hello again. Um, so how did the factor of race help or hurt the ADA legislation gain media attention and ultimately get passed? Well, I think I mentioned this earlier that uh, we, we, I include myself in the disability rights movement, um, copied much of, the, uh, of what the Freedom Riders and others had done in the late 50s and 60s to get the Civil Rights Act passed. So uh, I don't know if race itself had any factor there, but we certainly emulated what African-Americans have done to gain their civil, civil rights. Uh, but I don't, I don't think the factor of race, I can't think that that really was a factor. Um, the, the biggest factor at that time was AIDS, gay people. Uh, and Jesse Helms and others that, that, uh, that thought that, uh, that uh, if, we, if, we, if, if we allow persons with AIDS to be in that disability community, then we're all gonna get AIDS. <laughs> that, was, that was more of a factor than, than race. It was basically health at that time. Uh, but I, I, I can't, I, I, I'm hard pressed to think that race had, had really much to do with it. With, with the passage of the ADA or the hindrance thereof. I, I don't think so. All right, we're getting close to the end. Uh, let me uh, turn to Toshin for uh, question number four on your list, Senator. Um, and I think that should be our last question for today. Thank you so much, uh, Tosi again. Uh, so uh, the question is, uh, we realize that about 99% of people that apply for disability insurance first will be rejected. And after a lot of war and battles, eventually, maybe after two years, they will be accepted. Uh, and this uh, gives them lots of problems. For some of them that don't have families to support them, they can be homeless, they won't have money for their medications and the rest of it. How can the Senate help reduce this? This waiting time. Well, I don't know about the Senate, but the Congress in its entirety could help uh, by, and I don't mean to get into politics, but if they pass the big reconciliation bill, the $3.5 trillion reconciliation bill, that has in there money that would 
enable Social Security Administration to hire more people so they don't have this backlog. I can tell you uh, without any fear of contradiction that there are people that have wanted to change drastically the Social Security system in America, privatize it. And one of the ways they do it is by death by a thousand cuts. And that is you keep cutting down the number of people that the Social Security Administration employs to handle the, the, um, the, um, the requests that come in uh, for disability coverage and you string it out the time uh, and then you just disprove. I forget the figure you use. I, did you say 90%? I don't know. But I know, I know the rejection rate is high, but once the appeals are heard by the appellate officers, those are more often than not overturned. Uh, but the waiting period becomes years and years. So we need more personnel in the Social Security Administration uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, go through the paperwork and approve these. And secondly, we need a better adjudication system uh, through the courts for people to be able to file their appeals and have their appeals timely heard on whether or not the initial rejection was valid or not. Uh, but that's going to require some funding, quite frankly. Uh, but again, in all fairness and equity, uh, uh, a person who qualifies for SSDI uh, should not be disqualified simply because the Social Security Administration doesn't have enough personnel to handle their their uh, their uh, their requests, their 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 applications. Um, so, yeah, it's going to require some some more funding, but but it's not that much. Well, Senator, uh, I want to thank you uh, on behalf of the class for spending this time with us. Um, as you mentioned uh, in the start, uh, I'm nearing 50 years of my career in uh, social work. Uh, and I have to tell you that in teaching this class, um, I'm very impressed with these students, their commitment, uh, their uh, desire to learn, and it will be fun to watch the things that they do over the next several years to uh, protect things like the ADA and to expand that. So thank you very much for taking the time with us. Well, Mark, thank you. Thank all your students. Uh, uh, and again, um, uh, I encourage you to continue on in your social work and, uh, and all of the things we covered, it's gonna require people like you to fix them, make them better. Nothing is static. Uh, nothing of what we've done in the past is gonna be static. I never even got into new technology. All the new technologies now that are opening up all new kinds of, of uh, employment possibilities for people with disabilities. That's gonna be a huge thing in the future. You can be in the forefront of making sure that the technologies that we are developing, the software and the hardware, are accessible and that people with disabilities are included in this whole new technology structure so they too can be employed. But to me, uh, this is one of the new kind of frontiers in terms of social work and especially as it pertains to persons with disabilities. So thank you and uh, I, I hope you continue on with your, with your, um, uh, with your social work and your, your commitment to being uh, involved in social endeavors in our society. And if I'm still on the screen, come visit the Harkin Institute in Des Moines sometime. <laughs> and we have a whole section on disability and, uh, and you're welcome to come visit the Harkin Institute. By the way, if you do, the building is finished and I think it's the most accessible building in America for persons with disabilities. Uh. Wonderful. Bye. Bye-bye, Mark. Bye.